Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you this morning. Let's stand up together. And there's a bunch of there's a bunch of new people in here. So find some of those new people, make them uncomfortable, and tell them how happy you are to see them at church this morning.
Amen. You guys have a seat. We got a baptism. Good morning, church. This is Olivia Price, the young lady. I've had the privilege of watching her little brother grow up with us here at BBC Kids. And uh, after going to Central Kid Camp this summer, she started asking questions. And a couple months ago, she said the prayer to accept Jesus right here in the kids department with us. So. Okay. All right, Olivia, pray with us. Did you accept Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Yeah. All right, it's with great joy that I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, amen. We just saw, sang just a few moments ago, Glorious Day, and yes, it's a glorious day with Miss Olivia. We celebrate with her today and her family and, and teachers that all have just watched her grow up and accept Jesus as a personal Savior. And, and you know what? That is just awesome. I mean, it's our dream here for all of our children in prayer that they do accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And also our kids in our community. You know, our community is filled with children, and we would love to have you at any time join us in the children's department. We can always use some extra hands and spread the love of Jesus to all of the children here in all Boone County, Kentucky, and on. So my name is Beth Claxon, and I'm the Children's Ministry Director here at Burlington Baptist Church, and it's so good to see each and every one of you all today. If you're a first-time guest with us, we welcome you in, and thank you for joining us, and we would love to connect with you, and the best way we can do that is through a connection card. So you can scan the QR code in front of you on the chair backs. That'll take you to an online connection card, and you can fill that out. Or if you want to, you can just stop back in our atrium at our information desk. They'll give you a good old pencil, and you can fill out a connection card. We just want to let you know of some other opportunities in our church that you may want to get involved with and some things that are going on. And we've got quite a lot of things going on. And the first thing I want to bring to your attention this morning is our Married Life group. They will be doing their kickoff tonight. Um, that will be at 6 p.m. here at the church. They're going to be doing a six-week study called Kingdom Marriage. It's a Tony Evans study. So if you are engaged to be married or married, they would love to see you here tonight at 6 p.m. for the kickoff for the married life. Um, our student ministry pastor, Jonathan Brewster, would like to meet with the parents of students. So if you have a child who is in the middle school or high school, he would love to meet with you um, with a parent meeting on February 28th. That'll be at 6 p.m. He's going to go over the calendar for the rest of 2022, and he just wants to let you know of some other policies and things that he's put in place as you go on overnight trips. So again, that's February 28th, student ministry. If you have a middle schooler or a high school, he would love to meet with you. And one other thing I'd like to bring to your attention this morning, and that is on Wednesday, March the 2nd, our MOPS, which is Mothers of Preschoolers, will be meeting. They'll meet at 6.30. They meet the first Wednesday of each month. Now, you don't have to be a member to attend any of these, but especially MOPS. Um, it's for the community. So if you are a mother or preschooler, come on out. Of course, we have child care and um, programs for children that evening, and we'd love for you to join us at 6.30 p.m. So let's continue to worship, and as we do so, I, do so, I'd love to lead us in a word of prayer. So will you pray with me, please? Father God, we just come to you this morning with awe and thanksgiving of who you are, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. God, we thank you for this time that we can come together. It's a privilege to worship and praise you, Lord. We love you, and we thank you for your love. And God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross to save us from our sins. God, help us to be good stewards of your message as we spread it to the children and to, to everyone here in our community, God. It's your call for us, and help us to serve and serve well in that, Lord. Continue to be with us now, and, and we invite the Holy Spirit to come, God, to open our hearts and minds, God, to receive your word. Be with Pastor Harold as he brings our message that you laid on our heart. And God, we just now lift up our voices in song to you and praise you. And we pray these things in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that baptism was so awesome. It broke the baptismal pool back there. But that's okay. We're going to stand up. We're going to sing over top of it. So join us again as we sing. One, two, three.
that's not awesome. Have a seat. Have a seat. Uh, this next song is just a, it's kind of a prayer put to music, which is awesome, which makes some of the best songs. And, and Josh kind of turned me on to this song. Uh, he brought it up when we did our Studio 3 uh, thing that we did during the COVID uh, lockdown. And it's just a really good song. So if, if you know the words or want to sing with us, sing with us. If not, just meditate on them this morning. It's really, really, really good. to my soul Who can spin the world around and hold me ever close Who can search the depths of me Love me to the core Controls the world I see, walks me through it all. No one but you. No.
sing to the Lord this morning and you all sound good. Thank you for being here. Love to invite you to turn to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel's one of those prophets, one of those minor prophets and uh, we've been going through the book of Daniel in a series called Courage in the Midst of Chaos and uh, Daniel is a man of great courage. Uh, he is a prophet beloved by God and uh, at the end of his life God gave him a vision of what was going to happen in the uh, from his time to the end of times, and uh, this morning we're going to specifically talk about the coming of the Antichrist, and uh, and so Daniel chapter 11 is Daniel's final vision, and uh, I'm going to try to give an overview of the first 35 verses, and then, and some of this information Daniel has seen before in previous visions about kings and kingdoms, so I'm going to give an overview of that, and then we're going to specifically talk about the Antichrist in verses 36 through 45. And I'll try to fill in some of the blanks. Uh, we have some guests here today, and so I don't want you to be lost, uh, but we are in a tough book, and, and so I'll try to catch you up as we go. I'd love for you to stand, and uh, we're going to read verses 36 through, we're going to look at verses 36 through 45 specifically. Let me read verse 36, and we'll pray. Let me say that uh, Harold and Ida celebrated 70 years this week, and we celebrate that today, I think, Roy and Donna have 64, so happy anniversary to Roy and Donna. Yes. Good to see you. All right, verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished for what is decreed shall be done. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we humble ourselves this morning before your word, and we acknowledge that your word is living and active and sharp and true, and we need it, and uh, we pray for your help this morning, the help of your spirit to understand your word. Uh, Lord, um, you're going to share some things about uh, end times and, and the Antichrist, and, and we want to be aware, and we want to be on guard, and at the same time, we want to be intentional about sharing the good news of the gospel. We want people to know what Jesus has done, and dying on the cross for our sins and providing a way for us to be saved. And I, I pray that that message will be clearly presented this morning and, and some like Olivia might come out of the darkness and, and have life in the name of Jesus. We pray you would do that. Uh, Lord, any distractions, we pray you might remove those for just a few minutes that we might be able to hear from your word. And I pray your forgiveness of my sins. Help me today to proclaim your word with truth and clarity with your help, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let, let me just start by reminding us of the theme of Daniel. And, and not just Daniel, really the Bible is a hoe. But really the theme is that our God is sovereign. He reigns. Uh, he is in control. This is His story from the beginning of creation, and we have a record of that in Genesis, to the end of times, and we have a record of that in Revelation. God is in control, and this is His story. And so I just got two points this morning, two main points. The first one is that kingdoms arise and fall according to God's purposes. Kingdoms arise and fall. We could say kings and kingdoms arise and fall. And we've already seen that in Daniel, and we're going to see it even more in chapter 11. Let me give you an example at the start of this chapter. Verse 2, and now i show you the truth. This, this is the angel that we met last in chapter 10. And he has come, he's gotten through the, the prince of Persia in chapter, and he comes to bring this vision to Daniel. He says, I'm going to share the truth, I'm going to show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, 
And he shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken. And so kingdoms arise and fall according to God's purposes. And, and if we walk through this whole chapter, we would see kingdoms rise and fall. Kings rise and fall according to God's purposes. Now let me tell you this. There is coming a kingdom that will arise and will not fall. And that is the kingdom of God. That's an eternal kingdom. And we want you to be a part of that. And so we're going to share the gospel with you this morning. And we're going to invite you to turn from your sins and believe upon Jesus and be a part of His eternal kingdom. Now, let me quickly remind us of the context. Daniel 10, 11, and 12 is, is kind of a unit. And in this three chapters, there's one particular vision. And we're going to look at that. Uh, chapter 10 is kind of the, the context and, and Daniel is concerned about his people. Uh, the Medes and Persians have conquered the Babylonians. The king Cyrus has issued a decree in which he said to the Jewish people, you can go home. You can go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, rebuild the city, rebuild the wall. You can, you can go back. And yet we've talked about that only a moderate number of the Jews decided to return to Jerusalem. Now, we said there are several reasons. Uh, they've gotten comfortable there in Babylon. We get comfortable sometimes, don't we? It was a long journey home. There was a lot of work to do when they got back to Jerusalem. There were lots of enemies in the land that didn't want Jerusalem rebuilt. But, but maybe one of the most troubling reasons is they just didn't have a desire for the glory of God. I mean, that's all, that was the reason they go back to the promised land, is to reestablish the land that God had given them and rebuild the temple and bring glory to Him. And church, if we're not careful, we'll get so tied up in all the busyness of life and we'll neglect the most important thing. And that's loving God, loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and, and worshiping Him. And the enemy loves us to get us distracted by other things. And, and so part of the reason, they just didn't have a, a desire for God's glory. And so that was the context that we found Daniel last time in, in chapter 10. He's praying, he is mourning for his people, he's fasting, he's pouring out his heart to God, and uh, he's concerned about his people. And so the angel comes in chapter 11 that we're going to look at this morning. And the angel is going to give Daniel a, a vision for the end. And then in chapter 12 is kind of the conclusion to the book. And so we'll get there next week. As we work through this vision in chapter 11, we realize that God knows the future to the smallest details. God knows the future to the smallest details. And, and we saw this already in Daniel chapter 2. If you... If you remember, Daniel, uh, in chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. And in that dream was this idol, and it had a head of, of, of gold. And, uh, and, and Daniel interpreted it. He said, that head of gold is you. It's Babylon. And then he had a, the, the, le the arms and the, the chest was silver. That was the Mede-Persian Empire that would come. Uh, and then the, the stomach and the thighs was bronze, and that's the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great, and then he saw these uh, legs of iron, and that was the Roman Empire, and so God has already been revealing some of the future throughout this book, and so let me just quickly provide an overview of really the first 35 verses, and if you want to get into the details, uh, I encourage you to dive in, get you a good study Bible and some commentaries, and, and you can just walk through those verses. Let me make a few statements. All of Daniel 11 was future for Daniel. All of this chapter was going to take place in the future for Daniel. Now, it's history for us. We look back and we can uh, figure out who the, was in the vision. But, but these things hadn't had taken place for Daniel. So all this was future for Daniel. And secondly, there are, are approximately 135 fulfilled prophecies in these verses. 135 fulfilled prophecies. Listen, you don't want me to go through every one of those. You won't like me if I do. And, and so I'm going to try to give you uh, an overview. Uh, but these, this vision, verses 2 through 35, is so remarkably accurate and verifiable in history that the critics have argued there's no way that Daniel could have wrote this before it happened. There's just too many details. And so they said, there's no way Daniel wrote this before it happened. And listen, there's no way unless the God who knows the future provided the details to him. And church, that's what we believe. We believe the God who created the world, if he can do that, he can tell the future. And, and we believe that he shared these details with Daniel. And so uh, I just, again, want to provide an overview of some of the kings and kingdoms uh, that are referenced here. 
And uh, we could be more specific. We just don't have time to do that. So let's jump in here. Verse 2. And I'll show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And so we could name those three kings. We come to a, a fourth king there. He will be far richer than the others. Well, that king is Hosserus. Sometimes we call him Xerxes. Uh, we meet him in the book of Esther. And uh, if you read Esther, the very first chapter, it begins by talking about the king who has a big feast that lasts a 180 days. Let me, let me just point that out if you want to turn back to Esther, which is right after Nehemiah. Uh, it says, Now in the days of Hosserus, the Hosserus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, that, that's the capital of Persia, in the third year of his reign he gave a feast for all of his officials and servants the army of Persia and Media and the nobles and the governors of the... And so he gives this big feast for all these somebodies in the kingdom while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. That's quite a feast, and that's a long time, six months of, of feasting. And you keep on reading. He, then he gathered all the people and for seven days fed all them. And so in this vision that Daniel has, it says the fourth king will be richer. And, and so we see the riches of this fourth king. The end of verse 3, though, points out that, uh, or, or the end of verse 2, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. The, the next kingdom is the Grecian kingdom. Uh, verse 3, then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. Well, we know that this mighty king, this warrior king, is Alexander the Great. And this is the Grecian kingdom. And we discussed the history of Alexander the Great in chapter 8. And, and you can go back and, and check that message out if you want to. But it's just amazing. Alexander was one of the most remarkable men in history. Uh, by the age of 32, he had gained control over the entire known world. From Europe to, to India what was under his control. And his... Uh, Victories were swift and decisive. He was just a remarkable leader. He was a warrior king. Uh, some said that he wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. And so Alexander died at the age of 33. He got a fever. Most believe that he was poisoned. Uh, so we know who that warrior king is in verse 3. And then in verses 5 through 20, there's just all kinds of details that we can Look in here and, and find these kings in world history. The most powerful of these kings was Antiochus III, or Antiochus the Great. And he is specifically described in verses 10 through 16. Uh, and again, you can dig this out if you'd like to. And, and you wouldn't want me to try to pronounce all the kings that are being fulfilled here. If you like history, in the, in the middle of verse 17... It says, he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom. Uh, his daughter's named Cleopatra. And so some of you have read about Cleopatra and, and that story. John Philip says, Antiochus III gave his own daughter, Cleopatra, then only 11 years old, in a treacherous marriage to Ptolemy V of Egypt, a boy of 12. He hoped his daughter would help him complete his control over Egypt. However, she sided with her husband and defeated her father's plans. All that's in this verse. I mean, he wanted to get his daughter to marry the king of Egypt so that he would kind of have a spy in Egypt and be able to gain control over them. And she sided with her, with her husband. It says there at the end of verse 17, but it shall not stand or be to his... It, it backfired. And so the part of that vision is describing that. Now, you might ask, why would the Bible record something like this? And it's just to remind us that God knows the future before it ever happens. And then we get to verses 21 through 35, and we find a description of uh, uh, an evil, ruthless leader uh, named Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Antiochus IV Epiphanes. Uh, we talked about him in great length in chapter 8. And uh, historians tell us that uh, during his attack on Jerusalem, he killed 80,000 Jews. He uh, sold another 40,000 into slavery. Uh, the history of this evil leader is recorded in two intertestamental books, the book of Maccabees. And we said those two books are in the Apocrypha. 
in between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, there's about 400 years, and there are some records of the events in those years. Well, the Maccabees record the events of this evil leader's life. And uh, he was determined to extinguish the Jewish religion and replace it with the Greek culture and Greek worship. He, he hated the people of God. He was a type of the coming Antichrist. And so he shows us a, a pattern for recognizing the future Antichrist. And so some verses, verse 21 says, In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not... There, there been no one as evil as him come to power. It says, He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And, and so... Epiphanies, and, and we think the Antichrist will be some charismatic leader who will try to flatter the nations. And so th this description is, is pointing us to the one who is to come. But then we get to verse 31. He forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take it away, the, the regular burnt offerings. And he shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. And so he's going to profane the temple. And, and so we said that Antichrist is a... He's the Antichrist of the Old Testament. I think we could say that. And, and he puts a stop to the temple sacrifices. And he, he, uh, he disallowed circumcision. Those things are very important to the Jewish people. I mean, it was a sign of the covenant. He, he disallowed that, but he didn't stop there. And, and we talked about some of this, but Antiochus Epiphanes put a statue of Zeus. He brought that into the temple, and he demanded that the Jews worship Zeus instead of their God. And in his words, he, he brought a pig into the temple, and he slit its throat, he sacrificed it on the, the sacred altar, and then he took the blood of the pig and he spread it throughout the inside of the temple. All that is the abomination of desolation that it's talking about in verse 31. We've already talked about it's It's part of what Jesus makes reference to in the, in the Gospels. And so Daniel is once again given a vision of all that his people, the, the Jews, would endure in the years to come. So their exile's over, but they've got a lot to endure until the end. And now you might ask the question, why? Why must God's people endure so much persecution? I think that's a reasonable question. I think maybe 35 gives us a hint at the answer. Notice verse 35. And some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. And so my next sub-point is that God refines His people for their salvation. God refines His people with the go of their salvation. Now let me spend just a, a couple minutes in verse 35. Why has life been so hard for Israel? I mean, throughout history, all the way time, all the way back to this time. Why, why has life been so hard? And, and, and I think the answer to that is that they're a stiff-necked people. And if you have persevered in the Old Testament long enough, you, you've often said, Wow, God did all that, and they, they forsook him over and over. They're a stiff-necked people, and even to this day, they are being purged and refined, and that's still going on even today. Now you might say, what, what do you mean by that? Well, we see their stiff-neckedness in the Old Testament. Then we come to the pages of the New Testament, and, and Jesus comes, and, and Jesus came to the Jews. John... 111 says, I, I came, he came to his own, he, and his own received him not. Jesus came as a Jew to the Jews. He came to his own people. They did not receive him. John 5, verse 40 says, Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I mean, it's right in front of you, but you refuse to have it. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers abroad under her wings, and you're not willing? Jesus, Jesus had a, a love for his people, and yet they were just not willing to, to come to him. Paul said in Romans 10, 21, But of Israel, he says, All day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Now listen, church, if it were me, I would have thrown up my hands and said, I'm done with them. I'm done with them. Well, I'm not God, am I? No. 
I, but I want to say, listen, all that I've done for you over the years, I called you my special people. You are my people. I gave you a land flowing with milk and honey. I brought you out of Egypt, out of, out of bondage. I, I fed you. I guided you. When you got to the promised land, I fought your battles. I gave you covenants and promises and I gave you everything you needed. Listen, I sent prophet after prophet to warn you. And you repeatedly turned from my ways. You went against me. You worshipped idols. You ignored my instructions like the Sabbath. You, did, you didn't do anything I told you. And so while I would have thrown up my hands, listen, God is long-suffering and patient with His people. And to that we should say amen because He's the same way towards us. Amen? In Romans 11, Romans 11 says there's always going to be a remnant. Even today, there's a remnant of Jews who believe upon Jesus. And uh, Romans eleven twenty six, In this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And, and so there's coming a day when God's favor is going to be turned back upon the Jews, and they're going to be saved. And, and listen, people disagree about the future of the Jews. And, uh, I mean, I've got friends, and we, we would disagree about God's future for, for the Jews. But my study of Daniel just, just reminds me that God isn't done with them yet. And so in, in verse 35, this is a gracious suffering. And it reminds us that God does not give up on His people. And so the, the whole purpose of, of all the suffering was for the spiritual purification and refining. And God has always used suffering for that purpose. The prophet Zechariah said in Zechariah 12.10, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, that's, that's talking about Jesus, when they, when they look upon Jesus, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And so I believe there's coming a day at the end of time then uh, when the Jews will realize that Jesus was their Messiah. Now, they killed him, but he was the one who came to deliver them, and many will come to repentance and faith. Zechariah goes on in chapter 13, verse 1 says, On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And so here's the bottom line. God is gracious towards sinners. Now, some of you here this morning, you're still in your sins. And I may, let me just graciously warn you, don't presume upon His goodness. You're, you're not guaranteed another day of life. And so don't put off a coming to Jesus in faith. He has been gracious. He's gracious this morning and given you another opportunity to, to respond. And, and we can find comfort in 2 Peter 3.9. This says that the Lord is not slow to fulfill His promises. He's not slack concerning His promises, as some consider slackness, but He's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. I, I'm thankful that God was long-suffering towards me. And so, and so here's the good news. He invites you today to turn from your sins and to believe upon Jesus and be saved. I mean, that's the good news. Listen, we're going to talk about a lot of history and stuff this day. But the most important thing is the, the good news of the gospel, that God created us. And He is holy, and we're sinners. And our sin separates us from God. Our sin deserves punishment. Our sins deserve death. Our, our sins deserve hell. But Jesus has stepped out of heaven. He came and lived a sinless life. And then He went to the cross. And on the cross, He took my sin and your sin. Paid the debt. Died on the cross. Buried. On the third day, He arose again. And He offers to save those who will turn from their sins. And listen, we want you to hear that good news this morning. And Romans 10, 13 says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And, and so until the day their eyes are open to the truth, they, they live under the chastening, under the refining, purging of the Lord. But verse 35 says, And some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end. For it still awaits the appointed time. That, that time of the end, that's an eschatological term. That, that means at the end times or the, the last times. The time of the end marks a, a break here. And so up to 
verse 35, we've been talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. There's a break. Now, church, we saw a break in Daniel 9, 25 and 26. And there's a break until we get to the end. And we said in this break is the church age. And we're living in the church age. And the gospel's going out. And the Gentiles are brought in. And people are saved. And, and then at the end is the seven years of tribulation. And, and so I, I think that's the, the break that we find here. There's a break. And then there's the coming of the Antichrist. And so when we get to verse 36, the king is speaking of a coming Antichrist. The king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the God of gods until the indignation is accomplished. And so that indignation is accomplished is referring to the final outpouring of the wrath of God. It is at the end of, of, of the tribulation time, the end of the end of the ages. So let's give just a little bit of attention. We don't have too much time, but let's give a little bit of attention to this coming Antichrist. And I don't want to give him too much press time, but, but he's in here and we need to talk about him. So the first point is that kingdoms arise and fall according to God's purposes. The second point is that an Antichrist will arise and fall according to God's plan. An Antichrist. Now, we're not learning about anything new here because we've been talking about Antichrist. Brother Michael talked about Antichrist in chapter 7. He's referred to as the little horn, Daniel 7, 8. We talked about Antichrist at the end of uh, chapter 8, uh, Daniel 8, 24. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. He, he's operating under the power of Satan. We saw Antichrist at the end of chapter 9, uh, Daniel 9, 26. The prince who is to come, that, that's the Antichrist. Verse 27, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And so we can't go back to that, but one week is seven years. And so it sounds like uh, when we put the pieces together that an Antichrist will make a, a treaty, a, a seven-year covenant with Israel at the beginning of the tribulation period. And, and he's going to promise to protect the, the Jews from their enemies. Do they have any enemies? They have lots of enemies. There are nations that want to wipe them out. They've always had enemies. They're the people of God. They're, they're all, so th there's some type of agreement, this peace treaty, that he's going to protect them. And back to Daniel 9, 27. And, half, and for half the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. And so it sounds like the first half, the first three and a half years of tribulation is somewhat peaceful. But we know that halfway through, the Antichrist is going to break his peace treaty with Israel, and he's going to turn against them in a, in a violent way. And when the Antichrist breaks this treaty with Israel, he's going to seize the newly constructed temple. So we believe there's going to be a temple there, and we could read Ezekiel and find some. But anyway, he's going to seize the temple, and he's going to demand to be worshipped. And so we've already been given some details Let's look just a little bit more specifically at him and his evil ways. Uh, and so, beginning in verse 36, the Antichrist description. He's going to do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. Listen, he's going to do as he desires. He's going to exalt himself. He's going to defy God. He is the counterfeit to Jesus. Now you think about Jesus. You remember he said, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me? Jesus said, I'm all about doing the Father's will. The Antichrist is all about doing his own will. He's going to do as he wills. Jesus is all about humbling himself. He had all the glory in heaven, and he would lay that behind and come humble himself, become, become as a man, be obedient to death. I mean, Philippians 2, he's going to humble himself, but the, the Antichrist isn't going to do that. He's going to exalt himself. Jesus sought to bring glory to to his father. But the Antichrist magnifies himself. He defies God. He will speak astonishing things, unbelievable things against the God of gods. Now we could ask the question, why would God allow him to do that? And let me just say this, God's only going to allow it for a short period. Until the indignation is accomplished and then he's going to put an end to it. And I think God allows this incredible blasphemy and oppression by the Antichrist to 
finally open the eyes of Israel to recognize Jesus as their Messiah. And they will turn to him in faith and be saved. Verse 37. It says, he shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall pay no attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He, he will have no regard for religions, family traditions. He will be perverted in his ways and in his thinking. Uh, that little phrase, to, to the one beloved by women, that, it's, in diff, it's difficult to interpret and there's lots of ideas. I, I believe he's talking about Jesus there because... The, he was beloved by the women. He treated them with respect and reached out to them. And they're there at the cross and they're there at the tomb. And, but, the, but, but the Antichrist will, will have no use for that. He shall magnify himself above all. He, he is full of pride. You've got to watch those who are full of pride. Verse 38 it says, He shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these. The God of fortresses, that... That speaks of military power, and, and that's his God. He, he wants power. At the end of verse 38, a God whom his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and, and costly gifts. His forefathers would bring the gold and silver and stones. They would bring those precious things and lay them at the feet of their gods as an act of worship. He'll acquire all those things with the intent of, of building a, a military might. He, he wants to build a, a a military machine. He wants power. Verse 39 says that uh, he shall deal with the strongest fortresses which with the help of a foreign god, Satan. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor, and he shall make them rulers over many, and shall divide the land for a price. And so whoever honors or acknowledges him, he's going to give them positions of leadership and, and possessions of land. He, he wants to earn their loyalty. He's a conniving one. And listen, that's really no different than communism. I mean, it's not about sharing. It's, it's all about the power of the dictator. Putin's not worried about the people of Russia. He wants power. And the same for Kim Jong in, in uh, North Korea, uh, President Xi. And Ch they're all about power. They're not about helping their people. What's well, the same with the Antichrist? He, he just wants power. In verse 40, we, we start to see there's some conflict. Now, you start getting power, there's going to be conflict in this world, and there seems to be some conflict coming, some insurrections, and it says at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. That's armies from uh, Egypt, Africa, and uh, the, the king of the north shall rush upon him, and I mean, that's probably Russia, or rush upon him like a, a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen. Now, let me, let me just note here, that, that, that was the language of the day, the chariots. I mean, they're not going to use chariots today. They're going to, you know, Daniel wouldn't have known what a drone was 3,000 years ago. I mean, so, I mean, they're, they're going to use modern warfare. And, and, uh, and we can look at other prophecies. If, if you like that, you can look at Ezekiel 38, and you can connect some of the pieces with Gog and Magog and, and how Russia and Iran and Arab countries, how they're all going to fit in there. Listen, I'm not smart enough to figure out all the details, uh, but, but, but it doesn't sound like they're going to have any success against the Antichrist and his army. Verse 41 uh, just points out that he shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall. Now, we know the glorious land is Israel. And so he's going to come to that land, thousands of Jews. Israel is going to be devastated. He, he mentions these enemies, Edom, Moab, Ammonite. We, we recognize them as the enemies of God's people. He's not worried about them. He hates the, the people of God specifically. And uh, let, let me try to land this plane. And uh, Daniel was just given detailed descriptions of future events and specifically the Antichrist. Even a specific location. Notice verse 45. And he shall pitch his palatial tents, or his, his palace, we could say, or his royal tents, between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. The sea is the Mediterranean Sea, and Israel's located between the, the Mediterranean Sea and the, the Dead Sea, and the, the holy mountain is Zion, the city of God, where the, where the temple is. Well, the Antichrist, he's, he wants his, his headquarters, his palace. He, he wants it to be, be located there. He, he sets himself up as God in the city of God, and he's experienced some victories, and so he wants to be treated as God. But church verse 45 doesn't end there, does it? 
Let me show you how it ends. Yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. And so in the last few minutes, let's, let's close with the Antichrist's destiny. Yet he shall come to his end with no one to help him. Now, we can connect some dots here with Revelation and Daniel and Revelation go right together. Revelation 16, 16, we know about uh, this final war. Revelation 16, 16, they assembled them at the place that in the Hebrew is called Armageddon. Armageddon, the, the hill of Megiddo, a, a location there in Israel. And Armageddon has, has come to be known as the place, and, and not just the place, but the time of the war that ends all wars as history draws to a close. And the last battle that will be fought there in this region, it won't be much of a battle because the Lord will quickly defeat His enemies. And so, in the next couple minutes, let me just kind of give you the rest of the story. The Antichrist, who's called the beast in Revelation, he's going to gather the armies of the earth to Armageddon. I, I, I don't know all the details on how he'll get them all together, but he's going to gather them there and uh, they're going to join forces, and they're going to try to defeat the line of the tribe of Judah. And we say, well, that's pretty dumb. What well, is? It is dumb. But they're going to try it anyway. And, and John, John sees it. And so Revelation 19, if you, if you want to turn there, I'll show you what John sees. John said, I, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. He, he sees the Lord on a white horse. His eyes are like a flame of fire. On his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And so the armies of heaven, we're, we're going to be there with him, aren't we? From his mouth comes a, a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And church, this battle is going to be so quick and so decisive that John doesn't even describe it. He just tells us the end result. Notice verse 19. And I saw the beast, that's the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting. Listen, listen, the Lord not only has the power to gather the armies and the enemies, but, but he has the power to defeat them. And so in verse 20, the beast was captured, and with it the false prophets. And uh, you'll have to study Revelations a little bit to see, but he did signs to deceive uh, and for those who received the mark of the beast. These two, the, the beast and the false prophet, were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The Antichrist will be thrown into hell. And that's his end. And uh, verse 21 says, And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting, sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. So they were slain by the sword that came from his mouth. Listen, the assembled armies of the world are defeated in a single moment by the power of the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Daniel 11.45 ends with simply saying, he shall come to an end. And we say, indeed he will. And it will be curtain time for the Antichrist and for this Christ-rejecting world. Now, I've learned a lot in this chapter, and, but here's what mostly. I've just been filled with, with awe that God shared such details with Daniel so many years before they ever took place. It's just amazing. Church, this, this is his story. All of history is under the control of Almighty God, and He has graciously shared it with us from, from the creation of the world. We, we don't have to guess at how all this came into being. He spoke it into existence from the creation of the world all the way to the end. He has laid it out for us. And listen, the very Word of God that tells us about a Savior who loves us and who stepped out of heaven to save us is the same Word of God that tells us that He's going to come back one day and He's going to judge this world in righteousness. And you better be saved. 
I mean, the same Bible that offers a saving gospel to those who turn from their sins and believe upon Jesus is the same Bible that tells us the eternal destiny of those who die in their sins apart from a relationship with Jesus. And it's hell. Eternal hell. Everlasting damnation and suffering. And so listen, Daniel 11 ends with the Antichrist's destiny. And this simple statement, he shall come to his end with none to help him. Listen, we don't, we, we don't want that to be anybody's future. But if you come to the end of your life without a relationship with Jesus, there's going to be no one to help you. Listen, I'm a sinner. When I come to the end of my life, my advocate, my Savior, He's going to be right there, and he's got me covered, and I'm going to stand in his righteousness. But if you're outside of relationship, there's, there's no one for you, and you're going to be damned in your sin. We don't want that for you. Listen, the spirit and the bride say, come. Listen, the preacher and the church, we invite you to come. We, we invite you to come and turn from your sins and believe upon Jesus Christ, and you have an opportunity to do that this morning. Will you bow with me? Father, thank you for your word and forgive me for any errors in my preaching this morning. But I, I pray most of all that I've been able to communicate that you love your people. You're long-suffering and patient. You sent Jesus to save us from our sins. We no longer have to stand on our own. We can have our sins forgiven. We can stand in your righteousness. Lord, I, I pray that if there's anyone here today who's never turned from their sins, believed upon Jesus, I, I pray that their eyes have been opened. I, I pray this morning that they might understand. They might not understand all that we talked about this morning, but I pray they'd understand how much you love them and the offer of the gospel that they can turn from their sins and come to Jesus and have life eternal. Save some this morning. We pray for that today. And Father, in your power, you're able to you're able to move in other ways. And so have your way amongst your people this morning for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand and listen? I I want you to be saved. If you're not, I'd love to talk to you about a relationship with Jesus and anything else that God's doing in your heart and life this morning. If I can help you, if I can pray with you. I'll be down front. I'd love to, I'd love to help in any way. Come out of sadness, wherever you've been. Come broken hearted and rescued. Come find your mercy, oh sinner.
Amen. Be seated for just a moment. Uh, so glad you're here this morning. Invitation never closes. If we can ever talk to you about a relationship with Jesus, we want to do that. And I'll be at the door at the end. Jim's going to come and give a certificate of baptism to Olivia and a Bible. And Church, you're a better way to start the service. Amen. 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 For all those who came with Olivia today, thank you so much. I, I'm, she's bound to be encouraged by that. I'm encouraged that you're here for her. R raise your hand if you're here with Olivia today. Look at all that, Olivia. Yay, thank you. We've got more friends than most of our deacons, so praise. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, married group tonight is going to have a kickoff at 6. Uh, that's for all ages. If you want to come out, we're going to have some... Uh, games and food tonight. You don't have to bring anything. Just come. They're going to introduce you to a, a six-week uh, kingdom marriage. And uh, if you're older and you think, well, that's not for me, listen, we'll, we'll do an older married group. We, we called them empty nesters this morning, but Danny said everybody over, every, people you are said, empty nesters. You said 50 and older over empty nesters. Yeah, I said I, they're not all over 50. So anyway, any age, we'll, we'll, put, we'll have a group for you if you want to come tonight. We'd love for you to do that. Uh, if Mark don't mind me putting him on the spot, Mark, would you raise your hand or stand up? For me? Mark Maynard is the editor of Kentucky Today, if you get that. It's called Morning Briefing, and your email. Did anybody get that every morning? Yeah. Well, you should. Go to KentuckyDay.com. It's good. I, every morning, that's the first email I look at. And it's, he tells you everything that happened. And, uh, but we're welcome him. He, him and his wife just moved to Florence. And uh, we're glad to have you today, and he would probably love to tell you about Kentucky Today if you don't get that. But that's a, a ministry of Kentucky Baptist that just helps people get the news from a Christian perspective, and we certainly need that. So thank you, Mark, for, for all your work, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you all for being here today, and uh, won't you stand, and I'll ask Brother Danny to finish whatever I've missed. Olivia, you're not getting off that easy. When we're done, you got to stand up here and let everybody come by and say hi to you. Congratulations, so. Yeah. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house, Lord. We just thank you so much for a baptism this morning and knowing that not only when we leave here, but when we leave this earth, that we get to spend the rest of our lives together as a group, as a family. And, and, and Lord, just eternity together just sounds awesome. We thank you for your son, Jesus, who gives us that opportunity. And Lord, help us to leave these doors and go out and just tell somebody this week about what he's done for us. We thank you, and we thank you the way you bless this church. We thank you for the visitors, Lord, and we just thank you for all of the people who just make this church possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 